Welcome back to Lights, Mics and Studios. My name, of course, is uh, Shal Toy, and I want to start a brand new series for the next couple of weeks, probably around about six or seven weeks or so, that I want to talk about the Lord's Prayer. And it's a very, very interesting thing. So what I want to do is I want to take the Lord's Prayer and unpack it a little bit. Every single sentence that Jesus makes with regards to the Lord's Prayer, see where we can find it in, perhaps in other pieces of Scripture, how the Jews at that stage that were listening to him, Jews and disciples, how they would have understood it and see what it means in our life. How it was understood, how we should use it and how we should change our lives with regards to it. So what I want to do is I first want to read it. It's found in Matthew 6, if you've got a, a, a Bible. It's Matthew 6 from verse 9. This then is how you should pray. Remember the disciples asked Jesus, how should we pray? Help us. How should we pray? Because it must have been intimidating to see him pray and then realize, I don't pray like this guy. I want him to teach me. Like, how should you pray? And then Jesus goes on to say, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Then there's a little footnote that says 13a. The Greek for temptation can also mean testing. Now what I want to do for the next couple of weeks is take every single sentence. My Bible's the NIV. It's been battered and bruised, but a Bible that's falling apart belongs to someone that doesn't, according to Charles Spurgeon. So mine is Bible, this Bible of mine is battled and bruised, but before each comma is a sentence. And I want us to unpack that couple of sentences every single week for the next probably about six or seven weeks or so. Very interesting. So today, if we take in each sentence that precedes the comma, the sentence for today would be our Father in heaven. Now, there's mainly two things that stand out from the statement from Jesus. Firstly, our Father, heaven, right? So what does that mean? It means that God is our Father. Now, you need to remember, having a look at John 19, John 19, 20 there, it's the crucifixion of Jesus. And then Pilate is asking the Jews, why do you want this guy crucifixed or, or crucified rather? And he said, they said that uh, he's, he's blasphemous. And then he asked what blasphemy has he done? Because blasphemy at that stage would have been not only disrespecting God, but Pilate was not believing in the God of Jews, but also neglecting the, or, or rather disrespecting the, the king of Roman, Caesar, in, in, in the Roman times, king of Rome would have been Caesar then, or the Caesar, or whatever the case might be. So, interesting our father then they said he's blasphemous for that and the second thing is he's blasphemous because he's calling himself the son of god saying god is our father now why is this interesting because he teaches his disciples this is the very beginning of jesus's public ministry right teaches his disciples call god your father i find that incredibly interesting and i find that very very satisfying to the deepest, most inner parts of my spirit. Why? Because Jesus, or God rather, in James 1 verse 27 in the Bible says, How do you know that you serve God, who take care of the widows and the orphans? God longs for a fatherly relationship with each and every single person in this world. He wants to be called Father. Jesus, that made very well known to us, and the fact that he made that known to us, cost him a very, very high price. It's cost him his life. That's why he's crucified. In principle, he was crucified because he loved God and called him Father, said he's my Father. That's why Jesus was crucified. But he makes it more personal to us. He not only says to the Jews that was listening to him, you know what, God is that random guy with Moses out there in the tent of meeting. God is that guy out there in the temple. You need to go to the wall to stand there and pray. You need to go to the temple and all that. God is very close and very dear to you. Uh, Psalms 2, David wrote the, the, the words, the following words in Psalm 2. He said, today I heard by the Lord my God, you are my beloved son. In whom I am well pleased. The Jews knew this. So they must have heard Jesus said this and said, but that can be true of every single one of us. 
Now that word sound familiar to you, it must sound familiar to you because of the fact that in the Bible, when Jesus was baptized, there was a, not only that the spirit in the shape of a dove came down and rested on him, there was the words spoken out of heaven who said what? This is my beloved son in who I am well pleased. God himself made him known to the people that were standing around Jesus saying that this is my son. Now Jesus is saying every one of you can call God father. In fact, start your prayer by acknowledging the fact that God is our father. Our father who art in heaven. When we read the book of Deuteronomy, and that's where obviously where the Israelites was wandering through the desert for 40 years. God made a very, very well known. Well, it's probably not that well known, but it's something that should be well known. A statement to Moses when he said, Moses, you know what? When you guys was wandering, when you were lost, when you were hungry, I was the one that was taking care of you. And then he says the following. I carried you like a father will carry his son. Should we not then note that throughout the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament, that God wants us to call him Father. He wants to be our Father. We're currently living in a world with a fatherless generation. Lots and lots of people do not have fathers, especially in South Africa, especially in great parts of Africa. People are busy or fathers just backed up and left. And if that's the case in your life, I want to make the following statement by saying, you know what? Jesus paid a very, very, very high price in order for you to have a father. And he can be closer to you than a friend. And he's every single place that you go, he's there. God is our father. And then we go to the second part of the sentence, who art in heaven. Very old English. Uh, in fact, the New International Version just says, Our Father in heaven, not whom art in heaven. Why would Jesus make that statement? I think it helps because now we've got an address. Where's God? God is in heaven. Is God then no longer everywhere as we're also told? Is God not omnipotent and omnipresent? Uh, God is omnipotent and omnipresent. But Father God is in heaven. Your Father is in heaven. In other words, coming back to the fatherless generation, you all of a sudden have an address of your dad. The one that you thought you did not know, you know. He's in heaven. He's sitting on a throne. His eyes, according to the Old Testament, is scorching throughout the entire world, looking to see where his children are. And when they are in need, he rushes to them. Our Father who art in heaven. But let's unpack heaven for a bit and see what heaven is. Heaven is a place. Heaven is a place that's timeless because God is there now and will forever be there. God, heaven is a place that's perfect. There's no pain. There's no sorrow. There's no sadness in heaven. And heaven is a place that's filled with love. The fact that you might not have a dad or think that you don't have a dad, you might not have an earthly dad or biological dad rather, but you've got a dad that's perfect. You've got a dad that's sitting on his throne and his eyes are seeking throughout the entire world looking to see where you are. Not only that, he's timeless. He's in every single situation. In every single thing that we do, God surrounds us. He's wrapped in it. He's enveloped in that. God is present because he's timeless. Jesus did not say our Father who is in heaven to make us think that God is far. Remember in the Old Testament, when, when Elijah was fighting the Baal prophets, what did he say? He said to them, perhaps you shout louder, you should shout louder, to wake him up, perhaps Baal is sleeping. Our God has never been sleeping, and our God has never been silent, and our God has never been deaf. That's not why Jesus said our Father is in heaven. He said, our Father is in heaven so that we can know that He's timeless, He's perfect, and He's loving. God is perfect. He's not the Father that will arrive late. He's not the Father that will leave us up to ourselves. He's not the Father that will not protect us. He is the perfect Father. And lastly, 
In Him there is no sorrow, there is no sadness. There is no guilt, there is no disrespect. That's not who God is. God does not fill us with sorrow and sadness. For a long time, a lot of us have seen God sitting up on His throne in heaven, being as a very angry guy, just waiting to slice us up the thunderstruck, or whatever the case might be when we sin. Of course, we should not sin. It's not the holy lifestyle that we adhere to be. But that's not who God is. God is loving and He's waiting for us to come back. If you see the Gospels and read the Gospels, you would throughout the entire time, throughout all the parables that Jesus taught, saying that His Father is running to His Son, the wayward son that's coming home, that's who God is. He's following us. He's coming after us. And he's timeless and he's perfect and he's loving. Your sadness can turn into joy if you remember the fact that your God is the Father. So, what should we do then? Your prayer life should look like this, like what Jesus instructed, our Father who's in heaven. So start your prayer, as we said a couple of weeks ago, by a by adoring God. How can you adore God? God, you are my father. You are the one that's protecting me. You are the one that's taking care of me. And you're the one that's not distant. You're the one that's perfect. You're the one that's timeless. You're the one that's providing for me. And you're the one that's protecting me. You're the one that's glad with me. And I said there's no sadness, but you're the one that's glad with me. The one that is sad with me. The one that smiles when I smile. And the one that frowns when I'm down. You are the perfect God. Remember to come back next week and we'll unpack the rest of this amazing prayer that we are taught by the Lord Jesus Christ. From myself, Charlotte, we're looking forward to spending the next couple of minutes with you next week.